enjoy it while it lasts, uh, turn in your Bibles to page one. <laughs> As we look at the very first two verses in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter one and verses one and two. In fact, i got to just see even if my Bible will stay open because it's that far in the front here. Today begins our march through the book of Genesis in a message I've entitled Beginnings, a journey that's probably going to take us a year to complete. And we'll take a couple of stretch breaks in that year to celebrate Christmas and Easter, perhaps do a topical sermon, entertain a guest speaker or two, but just get comfortable, buckle in as we move through this first book in the Bible. Whether people realize it or not, many of them are asking existential questions. Whether they say it out loud or not, they're asking existential questions, which is to say questions about the very nature of of what it means to exist. Questions like, what is the meaning of life? On what basis is morality grounded? On what basis are relationships grounded? How is success defined? And how do we know if we're doing the right thing? Can I just point you to this? The answer to all of those questions that you need answers to is found here in the scriptures, existential or otherwise. Everyone looks at the world through a particular lens. Everyone has a worldview, and each worldview has to answer at least four questions. How did this all start? Why is it broken? Can it be fixed? And where is it headed? Every worldview has to offer an answer to those basic existential questions. And my contention to you is this, Christianity offers the most robust and satisfying answers to each of those questions. The redemptive work of God expressed in the gospel of Jesus Christ is not only the answer to your questions, but it is the basis for your hope. The Christian faith is not a blind faith. It is not an unreasoned faith. The Christian faith is not only true, but it provides the best answers to the questions that we ask. We tackle the first of those questions today in these first two verses in Genesis. How did this all start? Verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness covered the surface of the watery depths, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. God created everything. That's the main idea. God created everything. Let me first begin by acknowledging the work of some of those who have helped shape my thinking on this book. Works by Alan Ross, Sidney Gridanus, Abraham Curavilla, Ken Ham, and Ken Matthews are my companions on this journey. You'll hear from each of them throughout our time in Genesis. And as a matter of context, it's important to acknowledge the various scholars have approached the book of Genesis. Ross says this, expositors may simply retell the stories and then draw a few general lessons from them. The biblical narratives, however, are far more than illustrative stories. They are highly developed and complex narratives that form a theological treatise. Some traditions focus on the literary dimensions of the text. They give most of their attention to identifying the sources behind what has been considered a unified work of Moses. Yet in an attempt to identify sources apart from Moses, they end up dissecting the book like a biology project. There is an undue skepticism from each of these critical scholars. There is an unwarranted tendency to suggest that the material produced and presented in Genesis is the product of later religious ideas through the creative genius of Israel. Some traditions focus on the historical, ideological, and psychological elements of the text. Their primary purpose is in discovering the formation and the transmission of Israelite traditions in the oral sense. But this approach is highly subjective, leaving it to the interpreter to find the emphasis that holds the text together. Furthermore, it tends to misrepresent the relationship between the oral traditions 
and the ancient Near East. Some traditions focus on the form of the text. They emphasize genre, structure, and setting as the primary study. But form critics assume that poetic composition lies behind all of the stories in Genesis. In other words, they assume the stories are arranged to fit larger poetic purposes. Rhetorical critics make the same mistake in their emphasis of the rhetorical structure to the neglect of the historical and transmission of the text. There is an assumption that monotheism developed from polytheism, that miracles are unlikely and the records are not actual history. Like the literary critics, there is too much of an attempt to separate the narrative intentions of the writer by genre or rhetorical structure. And while recognizing these structures is essential, doing so without consideration of the historical or the narrative implications is counterproductive. The final written copy is the canonical text, the Bibles that you have in front of you. You don't have to wonder what God said or what God intended to say. The starting point for our study in Genesis is the Scripture. That Genesis is a revelation from God. That Genesis is 2 Timothy 3.16, God breathed. That is authoritative for teaching, for correction, for rebuke, and for training in righteousness. The theme of Genesis is blessing. It's blessing, which is often met with its counter, cursing. God blessed the animal life. God blessed human life. God blessed the seventh day in creation. God blessed the patriarchs with unusual provision from above. God blessed the nation with a special status above the rest of the others. And since this blessing was from God, it came with the requirements of faith and obedience. Ross says that participation in the blessing of God was not for unbelievers who turned aside to evil. The tension between blessing and cursing is also found in the tension between good and evil. As much as God's creation is described as good, evil plays a big part in the book of Genesis. It reminds us of the sinful nature of the human race and the fallout that results from sin. The work of God transforms nothing into something, creation into complete and fully blessed and at rest. If the theme of Genesis is blessing, the purpose of Genesis is to s describe the recipients of that blessing. The recipients are a people, a people that is established and preserved by divine intervention, a people whose offspring would be God's people, a people through whom all of the nations of the earth would be blessed. And the very be first blessing of God was the creative work of God, his work in the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Ken Ham reminds us that if this first verse in the Bible isn't true, then the rest of the Bible isn't true. But if we believe this first verse in the Bible, we won't have much trouble believing the rest of the Bible. Genesis 1.1 is foundational to Genesis 1. And Genesis 1 is foundational to Genesis 1-11. through And Genesis 1-11 through is foundational to the rest of the Bible. The book of Genesis is foundational to everything. Like a game of Jenga, if you deny Genesis 1-1, you might as well deny the rest of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, other ancient Near Eastern creation epics, Epic of Gil Gilgamesh, for instance, feature multiple gods. And along comes the Torah saying there is one God. Other cre creation epics tell the story of a genealogy of gods who beget. Along comes the Torah, saying before all things was God. Other creation epics feature God Marduk, who had to create heaven and earth from the upper and lower halves of the slain goddess uh, Tiamat, who is the primeval sea. And along comes the Torah, who describes God as a craftsman in his workshop instead of a cosmic deity locked in mortal combat. Kuravilla says the sovereign status of the creator God is unchallengeable and the scope of his creative power all-encompassing, negating other speculations of godhood and notions of creation. All creation comes from his hand to do his will. So what do we make of Genesis? It's nature. Some view Genesis as a myth. For them, the myth mythical stories of Genesis are told to provide an illustration for truth. For them, myth is the natural language of religion. The question then emerges... Are the narratives of Genesis history or legend? And for some, they've settled on legend. But again, we say none of these objections are compatible with a healthy biblical view of inspiration. 
The Israelite patterns in Genesis depart greatly from any pattern in other ancient Near Eastern literature. Genesis is not myth. And not only is mythology foreign to the Hebrew concept of reality, but the New Testament scriptures assure us that the Old Testament represents actual events. The presence of archetypal figures does not negate the reality of those figures. The timelessness of the narratives does not mean the events did not occur in time. Poetic descriptions do not undermine actual events. Yet the modern historian is often willing to describe, unwilling to describe Genesis as history. But most modern historians don't want to label Genesis as history because of the presence of religious ideas and supernatural elements that trouble them. But once again, it's not because Genesis isn't history, it's just because they're troubled. Modern history, it is presumed, can normally be verified by outside sources. With the hard science, hard sciences, causation can be empirically determined under repeated identical conditions. But history is not a hard science. History is a soft science. Causation cannot be empirically determined under repeated identical conditions because with history, those identical conditions never repeat themselves. The facts of history are interpreted facts, both in modern history and in ancient history. Kazuto says that Israel has the distinction of being the first of civilized peoples to create a historiography in, full, in the full and precise meaning of the word. Scripture is a special kind of history. It is not intended to be a mere chronicle of events or a biography of a nation. It's primeval history the times of the patriarchs, the gradual incubation of a national consciousness among a people unused to independence. And yet, despite the historicity of the accounts, the concern of its author is not historical nor scientific. The author of Genesis was not grappling with issues arriving out of a modern scientific attempt to understand the structure, force, processes, and dimensions of the physical universe. He was not interested in the issues involved in modern debate over cosmic and biological evolution. In short, the author's primary concern is theological. Genesis represents three primary movements. Chapters 1 through 11 feature the origins of creation. Chapters 12 through 36 focuses on Abraham and the patriarchs. Chapters 37 through 50 focuses on Joseph and the metamorphosis that takes place in Egypt. The nation that emerges from Egypt in Exodus is a family that enters Egypt in Genesis. Although the book is described as the authorship of Moses, we know that the accounts were transmitted by witnesses to those events, eventually compiled by Moses. If the text has as its purpose the writing of a simple history, it would have been more comprehensive. If the text had as its purpose the writing of laws, it would have not used narrative reports. Genesis, in its broadest sense, belongs to the Torah for its theological explanation of everything leading up to Mount Sinai and Exodus. In short, the book provides a prologue to the law. All of chapter 1 is summed up in one verse, God created everything. The word for God here is Elohim. Elohim is the supernatural being who originated and rules over the universe. Elohim the majestic and sovereign who existed before anything. And yet we know that God's three persons were all active in creation, Father, Son, and Spirit. The Father and Spirit are clearly evident in the text. But we need not forget that God the Son was present at creation as well. Not only was He present, He was active. Colossians 1.16 says, For everything was created by Him, in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Jesus was present at creation. In fact, the first miracle was creation, the heavens and the earth. Poetic expression is intended to mean the whole universe. And he did so in the beginning, which is to say the first step in creating what we now know as our cosmos. In the beginning of the created order, but not of all things. Because John 1, 1, before the beginning of created things, in that beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. So let me restate verse 1 like this. At the beginning of time and the start of all things, God shaped, carved out, formed, and brought into existence the sky where the birds fly, the regions above where the birds fly, 
the regions extending out to the farthest star, and the regions of where God and his angels dwell. But God also brought into existence the earth, the solid part of its surface and the territory extending into its watery depths. That's the fullness of Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, the actions of God. So what were the circumstances of creation? Look with me at verse 2. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness covered the surface of the watery depths, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Verse 1 ends with the earth, and verse 2 begins with the earth. Verse 2 lets us know that something is wrong at the beginning. The world is formless and empty, waste and void. The fullness of blessing of the blessing of God could only come when waste and void was fashioned by God and given people in order for it to be pronounced good. And not only was it without form, it was covered in darkness. Darkness is the absence of light. Darkness is the presence of evil and death. Darkness would become the first thing that God had to deal with in the matter of creation. Darkness. The mood at creation was ominous and uncomfortable. The world was waste and void. The earth that God created had no definite form or distinct shape. It was a wasteland of nothingness, an empty space, an empty area. No light was present. Darkness and obscurity was the color of the watery abyss, the oceans, the rivers, and the seas. And not only was that darkness covering the water, but the Spirit of God was as well. The Ruach of God, the breath of God. Some have tried to suggest that the Spirit of God was a rushing wind blowing over the waters, but that's not what the text says. The word that's used here to describe the Spirit's action was hovering, not blowing, not rushing. It's the same word used in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 11, to describe an eagle stirring up the nest, fluttering over its young. In much the same way, the Holy Spirit of God was hovering and suspended over the surface of the waters, hanging in the air, tremoring over the waters, caring for the future development of a lifeless mass of watery earth. So is the earth billions of years old or thousands of years old? No one knows. No one knows. There are dating methods that assert both. And those dating methods have underlying assumptions that are exactly that, assumptions. There are conservative Christian scholars that assert a gap in time between verse 1 and verse 2, also known as the gap theory. They assert that Genesis 1-1 represents a summary statement of creation, and Genesis 1-2 begins with a recreation of sorts. Some choose this theory because it conveniently accommodates a modern geological dating. Some choose this theory because they ask the question, what happened between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2? How did we get from a creation of nothingness, ex nihilo, to a creation of formless and empty waste and void, darkness and deaths? What's the, what's from, is it nothing or is it formless and empty waste and depths? Even the casual observer has to consider that something appears to have happened between verses 1 and 2. Advocates for this theory argue it by citing a Masoretic text that includes a small mark between 1-1 and 1-2, a disjunctive accent that indicates that the reader is to pause before continuing on to verse 2. Even as you read your Christian standard Bible in front of you, you'll notice that the verse 1 is structurally set apart from verse 2. Uh, citing Deuteronomy 32.4, Isaiah 45.18, and 1 John 1.5, they would argue that God is perfect, everything he does is perfect, so a newly created earth from the hand of God should not have been without form, should not have been void, and should not have been shrouded in darkness. But perhaps one of the more compelling arguments for this theory is the presence of Satan in the world. Ezekiel 28 speaks of Satan being expelled from heaven because of pride. Revelation 12 speaks of Satan and his angels being thrown to earth. Jesus himself said in Luke 10, 18, I watched Satan fall from heaven like lightning. The formless and empty, the darkness, the waste and the void of Genesis 1, 2 is quite typical of Satan and his followers, those who were cast out of heaven. Those who affirm the gap theory tend to believe the earth is billions of years old and old earth. And of course, there are those who affirm a young earth. An earth between 6,000 and 10,000 years old. They don't subscribe to Genesis 1-1 as a summary statement. They don't believe that there's been a significant period of time between the verse 1 and verse 2. They don't see the words formless and void as a function of Satan's chaos, but the original description of the earth as introduced in verse 1. The state in which God began providing form to something without it. So, Pastor, where should we land on this? 
Well, let me just say this. There are Bible-believing Christians who believe in an old earth that is billions of years old. There's a Bible-believing Christians who believe in a young earth that's thousands of years old. Both affirm the inerrancy and infallibility of God's word, and yet they differ on this issue. Some are humble enough to acknowledge the frailty of their positions. Some are dogmatic and refuse to, to acknowledge the limitations of their positions. And to everyone who thinks they have it figured out, I will say to you, as God says to Job, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? No one has the upper hand on this discussion, inside or outside the church, because no one was there when it happened. But let me just offer some more food for thought. If you don't believe in miracles, you can't be a Christian. The Christian should not be scared by the supernatural. They should be encouraged by it. Who wants to worship a God who's limited by the natural world? That wouldn't be God at all. That'd be someone like me or you. Let me also say this. Science and scriptures are not necessarily at odds. On one hand, because using the term science concludes that there's uniformity and consensus among a very large community who call themselves scientists. In short, there is no uniformity, there is no consensus, and there is no one person who speaks for the entire scientific community. Furthermore, any tensions which are apparent between the Bible and science are exactly that, apparent. One commentator says this, thoughtful Christians familiar with the claims of modern science recognize apparent disagreements between the Bible and scientific claims. Many of the biggest tensions, however, arise not from the findings of science, but from the philosophical assumptions of non-Christian scientists. For the tensions that remain, Scripture offers principles for wisely navigating them in ways that honor God's revelation. In the end, because God is consistent with himself, all apparent disagreements are just that, apparent. And until we find their resolution, God has told us all that we need to know in order to trust him. In our finite perspective, with our finite minds, it appears as if there's conflict. But just because something appears as if it's in conflict does not mean that it is act actually is. So while we are not odds with the scientific community, let me also be clear, modern science does not stand in authority over the Bible. The Bible stands in authority over modern science. The Bible is not on the defense having to prove itself from a critique from the outside. Everything else, scientific and otherwise, has to be vetted through the lens of Scripture. God stands in judgment over his creation. God's word stands in authority over all things. We understand our world by first and foremost looking to God's word. Our response to Genesis is to recognize the enormity of God and the finiteness of creation. Our response to Genesis is to kneel down and worship our infinite creator. We say with the Apostles' Creed, I believe in God the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth. God, the one who made all things, the one to which nothing compares. God created everything. This passage doesn't give us points of application as much as it gives us implications. What are the implications of asserting that God created everything? Well, firstly, the universe had a beginning. The universe had a beginning. It was brought into existence. It was created by God. The Christian cannot entertain theories like the Big Bang, which so clearly contradict God's word. Who caused this Big Bang? Where did the material for this Big Bang come from so that it could happen? And after the bang went off, who arranged that resulting matter into form and gave it order? The big bang was not used to make the universe. But a big bang of sorts will be used to judge it. When at the end of time, God judges this earth by fire and makes all things new. Before creation, there was no earth. There was no time. There was no space. Apart from God, there was nothing. Not even nothing. It couldn't be black because black is something. That's impossible for us to comprehend, but on some level, it should give us an appreciation for how big God is, how powerful God is, and how many things we simply do not understand. God brought into existence something that had no previous existence. Hebrews 11.3 says this, By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is, not, what is seen was made from things that are not visible. 
The things we see now were made from materials that didn't even exist, but God brought them into existence. So what did God create? He created time in the beginning. He created space. God created the heavens. And he created matter. He also created the earth. He created time, space, and matter. But to say that something begins is to anticipate that it will at some point end. God began the universe with the end in mind. His final purposes in redemption, the new heavens and the new earth. Here's another implication to the assertion that God created everything. To say that God created everything means that God has no beginning. God has no beginning. The only thing that existed was God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. Apart from God, there was nothing. If God made time, then God had to exist before time. God doesn't have birthdays. God doesn't age. He is Exodus 3.14. I am who I am. He is Revelation 22.13. The Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Psalm 92 says, Before the mountains were born, before you gave birth to the earth and to the world, from eternity to eternity, you are God. If God made the universe, then who made God? Many people will say that the universe came into existence by chance. They'll say that matter always existed, which is to say they have faith that matter always existed. They have faith that matter by itself came to have form, but that's a terrible faith because matter by itself never made anything. It takes intelligence to make things. Some have faith that matter just came into existence by itself and appeared out of nowhere and made everything. But in no other has anyone ever been able to observe that phenomenon? Their faith isn't just faith, it's a blind faith. But the Christian faith isn't blind. It's a faith based on what we observe, Romans 1.20, for his invisible attributes, that is his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen since the creation of the world, being understood through what he has made. And as a result, people are without excuse. To look at planes... Cars, computers, trains, and buildings is to assert that they aren't here by chance. Intelligent people designed and made them. And the same is true for natural creation. To look at trees, flowers, animals, and people is to assert that an intelligent designer made them. A single cell, which is one out of a trillion in the human body, is more complicated than anything man has ever made, each containing its own programming and DNA. No one has ever made God. He has always been. He is infinite. He has no end. He has no limit. He is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. Luke 1.37 says, For nothing will be impossible with God. He is omniscient, all-knowing. Colossians 2.3 says, In Jesus are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. He is omnipresent. He is everywhere, all at once. Proverbs 15.3 says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. The Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, the great I Am. Another implication of this text is that God is the true creator. He's the true creator. When we create things in the kitchen, when we create things on the canvas, the CAD design, on the keyboard, or the welding torch, we are showing ourselves to be made in God's image. We are mimicking God's creative work in the world. And when we create, we take things that already exist and we form them into something else. When God creates, he takes nothingness and creates it into something new. Humans may make, form, or build, but only God truly creates. And finally, to say that God created everything means that God is the true sovereign. God is the true sovereign. To say that God is creator is to say that God is absolutely sovereign over all things. God's sovereignty means that all that he purposes will come to pass. God's sovereignty means that there is nothing that exists outside of his authority. It means that there is no threat to his rule. God's sovereignty means that everything he intends to happen will happen as he intended it. The humble Nebuchadnezzar responds in Daniel 4, For his dominion is an everlasting dominion. And his kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are counted as nothing. And he does what he wants with the army of heaven and the inhabitants of the earth. There is no one who can block his hand or say to him, 
what have you done? To acknowledge God as sovereign necessitates our allegiance and ultimately leads to our submission. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. His sovereignty means that you can't outrun his judgment, but his sovereignty means that you can't outrun his grace. You can't outrun his grace. And Spurgeon says, when you go through a trial, the sovereignty of God is the pillow upon which you lay your head. So I'll leave you with one final question. If God transformed nothingness into something, chaos into creation, how much more can you expect him to turn your void into something of value? God is in the creation business, but God is also in the recreation business. Whatever hole that you have in your soul, whatever thing that is keeping you from being who God intended you to be, Jesus Christ is the answer to that. He's the thing that gets you from the brokenness of this world back into Genesis 1-1, the perfection of God's design. Jesus Christ who came, lived, died, and was resurrected. Jesus Christ is in the recreation business. God created everything. He created you. And he's offering to recreate you, to redeem you, to save you. Will you follow him today? Let's pray. In these moments before I voice the prayer, I just, I want to just invite those of you who have never believed in Jesus Christ, who've been walking your own path, to consider God's work in the world. If God can do all of these things, then he can, he can help you. God's creation is good. And if there's any brokenness in the world, it's just because of our own sin. And that sin can be horrific sins like murder. Or it can be little sins like telling a lie or disobeying parents and everything in between. But every sin has devastating effects on the world around us and on your life. Perhaps the difficulties that you're going through in your life are the function of somebody else's sin. Maybe they've sinned against you. Maybe they've sinned in such a way that the ripple effects of their sin have, have touched your life. No matter what it is, you're, you're feeling the weight of that right now. Maybe, maybe the difficulties and the trials that you have are because of your sin. You made a choice, and you're having to live with that right now. But the brokenness that you're experiencing, the difficulties that you're having in your life, whether it's a product of your own sin or somebody else's, it is sin that is at the root cause of everything. And we will not know peace in our lives and we will not know peace in this world until the cure for sin, Jesus Christ, rules and reigns in our hearts and on this earth. Do you really believe that everything that you see and everything that you touch came from nothing? Do you really believe that it all was just an accident? Do you really believe that there's no intelligent designer behind this intelligent design? It takes a lot of faith to believe that. not so much of a stretch to believe that in the beginning God in the beginning God and right now God who wants to do a new thing in your life who wants to take you from where you're at to the place where he intended you to be anyways will you believe in him will you trust him with your life That's the invitation to you. To give him all of you, all you are, for all he is. If God is leading you in that direction this morning, I want you to come find me after the service. Find one of our elders, find one of our ushers. Talk about what God is doing in your life. 
Let us pray with you. Let us walk with you. Father, we give you this time, this time of response, this time of celebration, this time of submission, this time of reflection. We give you this time in Jesus' name. I pray, Lord, that you would complete the work that you have begun in this world and in each heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, welcome to King's Church. We're so glad that you're here with us. We are here to make disciples in Las Vegas who make King Jesus known in the world. And we do that by gathering, growing, and going. The best disciples are those who are serving inside the body or outside the body. So come join us for church on Sundays. Simple, relational, and biblical.